Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 614. That's 614 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope, I really do hope from the bottom of my heart that you're doing well. How am I? Pretty amazing, all things considered, pretty amazing. A bit of football, a bit of this, a bit of that. It's good to see Ronaldo back in training for United. Um, what else I've been seeing? I've been seeing some blowback with you know about the iPhone 14, which has been quite cool to see because it means we have finally been let go from the um from the gorilla grip that Apple had on smartphones and in the industry at large and the customer base looks like people just don't care as long as the smartphone's able to allow you to use your social media, use the internet and stuff for the most part, people don't need the Apple products. So maybe this will force them to innovate and change maybe the form factor or what it just generally looks like to make them a bit different from the others. Cause if you have an iPhone from like iPhone what ten upwards, they basically all look the same. So I've long argued that they need to have a bit of a refresh and shake things up a bit so maybe this will force apple to kind of change things and get off their butt and not rest on their laurels and also the best news to come out from this week has definitely been the flipping season finale of house of the dragon i've said it plenty of times on here because i was start i started to watch what rings of power i think came on first if i'm not mistaken or rings of power for the i don't know i'm not too sure but i think i watched rings of the power rings uh rings of power first before I watched House of the Dragon. And it has to be said, Rings of Power doesn't come close to House of the Dragon, even though Rings of Power has way more money invested into it, or it looks more visually stunning, especially some of the landscapes and stuff. Some of the wider shots look incredible. You definitely feel like you've been transported into that world. But soon after, once it gets into the character shots and you have to actually watch it on the strength of the writing, the strength of the acting, the character development, it completely falls flat. It's absolutely shocking how bad it is, especially if you've watched um, Lord of the Rings, which I did recently, and stuff like The Hobbit, which definitely wasn't well received at the time it came out. But the... The, the levels of quality are not even comparable so when house of the dragon comes out and it looks a little bit di not say DIY, but it definitely looks like it's less budget than um than rings of power but the story is so solid obviously the source material is flipping amazing they largely stick stuck to the source material which is always a good sign that series is going to be pretty decent even though there's some corny bits here and there for the most part they stuck to the source material and over time even though the pacing has been a bit off here and there the actual main um crux of the show is solid as hell to the point where they're thinking of doing you know um they're thinking of doing uh, shows on the side i think they're going to do one for the sea snake which i don't think is going to be that well received not because the actor's not good or not because he's a black dude or anything just because it's just not that interesting of a character i think in general i think it could have been other things they could have other characters in the series of house dragon they could have easily used as uh, someone to do like spin-offs from but maybe because he's actually alive in the books it makes more sense because everyone else you know spoiler alert maybe perishes or not at the end of this so i hope that's not a spoiler alert but if you read the books you'll know but in general, man, God almighty, House of the Dragons episode 10 season finale was incredible. The pacing of it, the the sort of tension that was rising from the start of, of the series all the way to the end. Even if you didn't read the books, you knew immediately something bad was going to happen to flipping Lucerius, man. Lucerius Valerian. I'm so, so, so sad for him because he was scared from minute one about stepping up and essentially having to assume his role and basically realizing that he's no longer a child now because in war and there are no children especially if you're a man and he finally plucks up the carriage to step up and basically wants to impress his mum and basically show her that he is you know as much as a Targaryen as any I don't know whatever that thing is right he just wants to basically prove to himself and to his mum that you know he's worthy of that name of that flipping legacy whatever it may be and plucks up the courage to go and do some diplomatic schmoozing and it ends in absolute tragedy and the reason why i like it is because essentially what this does is it throws into question everything we know about targaryens and their dragons because for the longest time it was kind of felt as if the dragons were like these um these kind of super obedient pets that the Targaryens just may do whatever they want them to do. But now we kind of get the idea that these dragons are actually their own sort of sentient beings, right? They have their own wants and desires in, in a very sinister way. Some of them not so sinister, some of them sinister. And clearly some of them are also cannibals in that they eat other dragons. So it's got that little scary element involved in it. And 
it's essentially a mistake is what led to the war. And I like that because it kind of reminds me of that story. I forgot who it is. Um, I think it's World War One or World War Two. but there's a famous story that basically the whole start of World War One or Two um, was started off at the back of um, some somebody that, that's very political. I forgot, maybe it was a king or somewhere. Basically, car broke down in the middle of the street and the assassin that was trying to, or the would-be assassin that was trying to find the perfect time to assassinate this person happened to be walking across the street at the same time that their car broke down. It was like a happens chance and they basically shot the person and then that basically led to World War One or Two. And that is essentially how most wars start. They don't usually start as some really super calculated conniving thing. It's usually very kind of innocent, throwaway interactions of mistakes or happenstances or wrong place wrong time and then suddenly you know it kind of spills over into this massive thing so i love how that end and of course the end of the actual episode itself with Renera is basically staring into the camera and basically you know declaring war without declaring war is awesome and i like the the the, the, the kind of um what I like about it. So I like the the parallel of that because I think when we first heard about this, because we saw it from the green perspective and so on from the black's perspective. I think when I firstly when I first read the read the synopsis for the show, it made it seem like they were gonna switch. They were gonna have you have the perspective of the greens of that episode of what happened, and then they're gonna have the black the black sort of perspective. But they didn't just carried on, but they just showed you the black's perspective, which is really cool. And I also like that they were such they mirrored each other. Um, Alison and Rhaenyra, right? They were both trying to, or Rhaenyra, sorry. They were both trying to um, not go to war because of the love they had for each other and because of basically what Viserys did what, on his deathbed where he essentially got everybody to make peace except for the kids. So the ladies basically felt like they should try to hold on to that peace as long as possible. But then things happen that basically drive them to war and obviously this kind of, you know, innocent or, you know, this thing that basically Aemon didn't plan to do because I guess he was just trying to scare Lucerys, but his dragon had other plans and it absolutely ended tragedy. And now essentially Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra is definitely going to declare war and do everything in her power to avenge her children's death. And she's already pregnant and she's already lost a baby too. So you can only imagine what kind of pain and hurt and frustration she's feeling now. So it's going to be pretty epic this season too. And unfortunately, we have to wait two years for it. It's going to debut in 2024, I've read, but I have read they're going to start filming in 2023, so they may be pushing it up to basically um, satisfy demand, but I'm happy to wait with how good this is. And to make matters even better as well, I heard or read something where George R. R. Martin said, you know, again, like he always does, A Song of Ice and Fire is going to be finished in what? It's about 75% finished or something like that. Let me see if I saw that right. Um... Song of Ice and Fire. I'm pretty sure I saw that. Was it? Was it that you just said it now? I'm pretty sure I read somewhere. Was it? Wh whatever the book is that he's. Is it a Song of Ice and Fire that he's not says? That's the one. Yeah, there we go. It's here. Uh, this is from WintersComing.net. Let's you know take this and use a pinch of salt because I'm reading it directly. And you know George R. R. Martin is known to be honey dicking his fans and. You know, he spent a lot. That's the thing with that, that that I'm frustrated with him about. It's not even that we're begrudging him for, you know, essentially becoming a multi-millionaire and becoming incredibly famous in his, what, 60s or something. No one's begrudging him for that. You know what I mean? Go ahead, make your money, do your thing. It's You only get one life. But it's the fact that he it enjoyed it and never, ever got back to writing the books. It's like, enjoy it, have your, have your time. But it's eventually, can you get back to doing what you do best? And that's writing books. But... I think some people have hypothesized, which I definitely agree with, is that he's left it so long in between enjoying his riches and enjoying the fame and the clout that comes with being George R. R. Martin and, re and writing flipping Game of Thrones, one of the best fantasy books of all time. He's enjoying it, but clearly, since he's been enjoying it, so much time has passed that he's actually maybe not giving up, but not say giving up. How do you say? How do you say this? he's kind of got bored of it maybe himself right and he's lost the motivation to, to 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 write it in the same way that you lose motivation to write essays and scores and shit so that might be the issue at hand that he generally lost the motivation to write it and he was just making up excuses and lies to kind of keep the fans um satiated to a sub point but at this point we're all either 
really angry, frustrated, or we've just kind of moved on. I haven't because I need to know the conclusion of these books. He has to finish it. Um, and it says here, George R. R. Martin. Sorry, the other night, a Game of Thrones creator, George R. R. took place in a live stream discussion with writer David Anthony Durham, set up by the publisher Random House. The occasion was the release of The Rise of the Dragon, an updated version of Martin's book, Fire and Blood, which serves as the basis of HBO Games of Thrones prequel. During that talk, so he was able to write a prequel for the Game of Thrones show, but he wasn't able to finish flipping. Oh, this guy, man. The Winds of Winter. Anyway, um, Martin gave us another update on The Winds of Winter, a long awaited sixth book of the Song of Ice and Fire saga. Obviously, Martin gets asked about Winds of Winter a lot, and it sounds like he has an answer down pat. You know, it's the same update I've been given a long time. I continue to work on it. It continues to get longer and longer. And I mean, as I was working on it the day before I flew back here for three or four days, I was rereading some chapters that I'd written earlier, and I didn't like them well enough, so I kind of ripped them up and rewrote them again. It was over a decade since the last book of Martin series. A decade. God almighty. A Dance of Dragons released in 2011. That's a long time to wait, but at least Martin promises that wins will be the biggest entry yet. It's a big, big book. I've said that before. It's a challenging book. It's probably going to be a larger book than any of the previous volumes in the series. The Dance of Dragons and Storms are two of the largest books I've released. There are about 1,500 manuscript pages. I think this one's going to be longer. And by that time, um, and by and that by the time I finish it. George R. R. Martin has never lied about Winds with the Productions. He's just bad at making them. Mike went on to say he's given up on making predictions about when the Winds of Winter will be finished, um, especially because he's blown past the deadlines before. He says, um, I make what I think is the best case to estimates and then stuff happens. Then everybody gets mad that I lied. I never lied about these predictions. They're the best I can make, but I guess I overestimate my ability to get stuff done and I underestimate the amount of interruptions and other projects that come my way. They're not interruptions. You accept them because there's money and cloud that's the thing you need to just be honest about it's similar to like a jordan peterson as much as he says like social media is a bad thing and it kind of ruins people let's be honest man you're you're a 60 or whatever plus year old man and you've suddenly become incredibly famous and people hang on your every word and they ask you questions on the gram or, or social media in general and they're you know and the answers you you are hoping are going to change their lives or significantly impact them it's okay to be kind of addicted to that kind of you know dopamine here it's okay to be high off your own supply in terms of people actually wanting to hear what we have to say same things that goes for george R. R. martin he's a man in demand and people are always going to be pulling at him to kind of get his view on certain things because of what he's written and the things that he's done in the past so clearly those interruptions are never going to stop coming it's up to you to decide whether interruptions either cross your table or not do you know what I mean he could easily do it and the fact that he hasn't is just just an excuse basically he's just enjoying the fame and the money and the clout which is not a bad thing just write the books and finish them when you can that's it nothing else if the novel Martin delivers ends up being as big as he thinks, it's possible the publisher could split it into two separate books and then there's a final entry of the series to think about. One day it will be done and then it will come out and then the next day someone will tweet me, when will the dream of spring <laughs> come out? I can see the future. Yeah, but just finish that one first before you start taking the piss out of people, innit? Just finish one. Fucking hell, this guy, man amazing but yeah hopefully it comes out soon but honestly please check out House of, House of the Dragon if you haven't it's absolutely fantastic moving on we've got some sick news courtesy of Mixmag which might actually get me to visit this location sooner rather than later sooner rather than later so it says as follows Irish nightclubs are set to be given a 6 a.m closing time from 2023 onwards absolutely incredible I've long had a desire to go to Ireland and see what the scene is like in there in terms of clubs and stuff especially after watching I forgot what that festival is called or whatever that they usually stream on flipping boiler room let me see if I can get hold of it here um let's see Boiler Room Island. Let's see if I got it here. Island. What's it called? It looks really fun. All the kids there look like they're really having a good time and they go absolutely crazy for us. AVA Festival. I really wanted to go to AVA Festival and check it out because the Boiler Room sets are probably some of the best. If anything, to be honest, those AVA Festival ones are maybe some of the best UK, you know, whatever, you know whatever this aisles however you'd call it or uh, basically you know people that look like us in terms of uh, um, streams that you definitely see the london ones don't compare some of the ones even outside london are a bit whatever because people are way too self-conscious and act too cool for school but when they stream over in dublin when they stream over in other places in Ireland, wherever they may be like belfast and shit oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god definitely definitely sick so it continues it says here 
Club Goes on Island could see their dance floors open up much later in 2023. The Irish government has agreed to an outline of legislation today that will extend nightclub opening times from 6am from 2023 onwards. With clubs currently having to shutter at 2.30am, which makes it difficult to leave London to go to Ireland just to rave until 2.30am is a bit of a waste of time. The plans drawn up by the Republic of Ireland's Minister of Justice, Helen Mc McEnty are part of a wide ranging overhaul of the country's licensing laws. Alcohol will be allowed to be sold until 5 a.m. with the extra hour granted for drinking and dancing time. Amazing. Opening hours for pubs are also said to be amended, allowing them to open until 12 30 a.m. every day. It's still amazing to think that this is a treat. You go to most bars and pubs in flipping Berlin and they open until 4 a.m., sometimes even later, especially if you become friendly with some of the staff behind the bars and shit. But to think that 12 30 a.m. Is, is a late opening is crazy, but it continues. Um, while bars with late licenses will be allowed to open until 2.30am every day bringing an end to the Sunday trading laws that force premises to close early Ireland's Tainate said um, Ines, what was that? Tanay, Tanaist, whatever that word is, said in the broadcast interview on RT it will improve our nightlife and entertainment and our cultural offering to people I don't know what, let's actually hear his accent I love the Irish accent, let's see Okay, the cabinet's considering the laws. Tanesti Leo Vacada said, okay, is this a, one of the guys involved in that shit? Let's hear what he has to say about the whole thing. Um, as you know, Minister McEntee is bringing proposals to government today to reform our licensing laws. Um, they're really out of date um, and uh, we want to cut red tape for business. Um, this is doing exactly that. Uh, I think it will be good for business, will be good for employment. will also improve our nightlife and our entertainment, our cultural offering for um, our people uh, and uh, that's one of the things that we want to achieve as well there are always trade-offs involved in this you know I know people will raise public health concerns um, but I think there is good evidence that um, people drinking at home uh, and they're doing that increasing numbers is not better than people drinking in a regulated setting amen uh, and I know people will raise safety concerns but I don't think the current situation where everyone enters out onto the streets at roughly the same time amen. Uh, is good uh, and this will result in more staggered um, nights uh, and crucially it is uh, also about improving our nighttime economy a project that began under the last government under Minister Madigan um, I don't see why the nightlife that we offer people in Ireland shouldn't be as good as anywhere in the world Amen. This, this, these new proposals and they are new proposals um, are a step in that direction will require more consultation and it also increase tourism there I'll literally go there more often it'll be a nice place to go to so I have to travel to maybe parts of mainland Europe I can easily get back home it's somewhere that's quote unquote quite familiar you know i don't have to learn a new language or have some flipping phrases on deck in order to navigate around and shit it'll be pretty sick um it says here um nightclubs and late bars um, will be given conditions to open under these extended hours including mandatory cctv installed on premises and security guards being registered and accredited with ireland's private security authority in a bid to mitigate fears that new relegation regulations so will lead to public health issues to be fair public health issues like what i experienced one time i went to hastings and i realized how how crazy it is and i realized that that was a scene out of those like tv shows where they show you um ambulance people and police officers and all that sort of stuff who work really crazy hours where they essentially have to look after people who kind of come out of clubs and what i realized quite quickly was that because we all come out of the clubs at the same time i remember when i was went to hastings the pubs could maybe close around the same time maybe 11 p.m or something but all the nightclubs and bar type places all close at the same time so you all literally get spat out and chucked and chucked out in the street at the same time there's loads of antisocial behavior people making noise people fighting and just being you know flipping drunken idiots and either flooding into the streets flooding into alleyways going to fucking takeaway shops and just trying their best to kind of keep the vibes going but everything around you is closed so it's a weird atmosphere and again it just kind of it just essentially makes people act more belligerent and it just maybe causes more issues for the local community especially if you're people who live near there you're sleeping and shit you have a family the last thing you want is to be woken up by a group of drunken wallads but if you have some places open at six it doesn't mean everyone's going to leave at six some people might leave at four some people might leave at three there's a staggered sort of entry there's a staggered sort of um, exit time so it kind of eases the pressure on all the public service goods and whatever services that are around in the area and it just makes it safer for everybody as well going out so i'm a big fan of it and also for the local businesses too it kind of allows them to make some extra coins with everybody out in there so i'm definitely part of it and definitely something i want to do the presentation will include a new scheme of pilot towns and cities including dublin 
um, Cork, Limerick, um, Kilkenny, Sligo, and Galloway. It's actually, where is Belfast? Is Belfast in Ireland or is it Republic of Ireland? Where is Belfast? Is in Ireland. Dublin, Ireland. Okay, cool. Belfast is located in the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland is Belfast. And then I guess Dublin is Ireland. Am I, am I that right? Or am I, am I fucking geography that crazy? Yes, it looks like it. Okay, my bad. But yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. Hopefully, it'll be something to do. And definitely add to a list of things that I want to see. <clears throat> and then I was thinking about this just now because I just saw this posted actually on RA, like a little reminder thing. But Jägermeister and Trezor have got this event or this little, no, event, this um, initiative going on called Hashtag Save the Night. And they're, they're basically giving a prize fund out of 50,000 euros that's going to be split between some winners and the deadline for the you know proposals is november the 1st and i think i might put some proposals across you know i definitely think so um these best ideas how to improve nightlife or receive a share of the 50,000 euros i've spoken a lot on here about my passion for nightlife about my passion for music in general dance music specifically about my passion to be a professional dj at one point and just my passion for clubs and you know obviously the flipping techno tourism stuff that i do and i have some really decent ideas i think and i think in the future anyway regardless of the professional dj um adventure that i'm going on i'm definitely going to have a club i'm definitely going to open a club whether or not it will be something i'll have for a long time it doesn't really matter but i definitely want to be able to look back on my life and say that at least i did it once just to try and see what it's like the same way some people will take over a pub and stuff or oh, i don't know they'll go go traveling backpacking through southeast asia i'm not really interested of in going backpacking through southeast asia i'd much rather just you know open a club and see how that is and see if all my ideas and kind of aspirations and kind of um, things i thought would work would actually work in practice and see what that's actually like and in general that service industry hospitality thing is something that i've always longed for and something i'd kind of want to get involved in so i would really actually like to give this a shot and see some from some of my ideas would resonate with people who actually are professionals in the industry and know what they're talking about so this is courtesy of um uh, ra it says jaeger milestone and berlin club trezor are closing applications for their save the night fund on tuesday november the first open since august 26 the campaign has received applications from all over the world people who are asked to submit ideas on how to improve nightlife particularly focusing on the areas of safety sustainability and diversity up to five winners will receive a share of the fifty thousand euros to implement their idea in 2023 and this is something that i have kind of um thought about for a long time anyway in general so the areas i'm kind of looking at especially when it comes to safety especially when it comes to diversity i'm all in the sustainability thing i'm not really too sure how to approach that but those two the safety and diversity are definitely stuff that i could definitely lend a good eye on and in general anyway i'm going to put my proposal forward and if it doesn't end up winning i'm definitely going to share it on the podcast anyway and let you know what my ideas were and you guys could either laugh at me or say oh my god you should have won really it says that the winners will be chosen by panel of artists and industry experts including sarah farina darwin asia james trezor founder dimitri hegman um dead hype founder bernard kussman or comson sorry com kumson and berlin Cup commission board member lee wan how do you pronounce that geb geb rab geb how do you pronounce that lee 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 wam gary bramrium gary bramian gary bramian gary bramian or is it her herbry mariam or Hebrew Mary. I don't know if it's a silent G or G, whatever it is, one or the other. I'm going to try to impress those people and see if they say yes. Find out more about Save Your Night, including how to submit your idea. You can also read our feature on why Night Life still needs help and listen to last week's exchange about protecting the future. I'll definitely cover this in another podcast, probably, and give you an idea on it. But you can check it out if need be yourself. Next one, list, we obviously have to talk about the breaking news of the day and stuff that's been breaking the internet, my side of town, especially when it comes to sneaker Twitter, streetwear Twitter, and yay Twitter, is Adidas officially caving to the public pressure and terminating their deal with ye flipping yay and obviously the Yeezy figure in general. Now, some people would say, 
Or I would say, I wonder if Vanessa Friedman is happy. She was out here lobbying for Balenciaga to drop him. She was also lobbying for Adidas to drop Ye. And now it's finally happened. I wonder if Vanessa Friedman, wherever she is, is she happy, furiously typing away on her laptop that Ye has been banished from fashion and essentially banished from footwear in some capacity, even though he probably could come back, especially with the purchasing of these factories that he's had um, in the last few weeks or months and stuff that's been announced. But regardless, go back to the actual statement at hand. And this is courtesy of Adidas Group, so you know it's official. You know you got the Herzog, um, what do you call it, site there where the where the per PR thing came from, October twenty fifth, twenty twenty two. This is on the PR site where they put all the press releases out and anywhere in general. It's all you know official, official, official tissue shit. So you know this is hundred percent real. Adidas terminates partnership with Ye immediately. Right, and they put it like in the title immediately. Adidas does not tolerate anti Semitism and any other sort of hate speech. Ye's recent comments and actions have been unacceptable, hateful, and dangerous, and they violate the company's values of diversity, inclusion, mutual respect, and fairness. After a thorough review, the company has taken the decision to terminate the partnership with Ye immediately and product production of and production sale of Yeezy branded products and stop all payments to Ye and his companies. Adidas will stop the Adidas Yeezy business with immediate effect. This is expected to be a short-term negative impact of up to 250 million euros to the company's net income in 2022, given the high seasonality of the fourth quarter. ALS is the sole owner, the sole owner, sorry, of all design rights to existing products as well as previous and new colorways under the partnership. More information will be given as part of the company's Q3 earnings announcement on November 9th. Now, to pick apart this whole statement, is interesting because the first paragraph I think is very telling because if you are paying attention some lady I forgot her name but this lady this lady that was on LinkedIn I think she posted a statement or a post and I think she was like the head of marketing or something and she was like oh what Kanye said was abhorrent really bad and I hope Adidas makes the right decision something on those kind of lines so I remember reading it thinking hold on this is somebody who's very high up in Adidas this is not like a marketing assistant or somebody doing like you know their version of like energy marketing or influencer stuff this is like a legit person that's been working at Adidas for a long time corporate person middle management upper management whatever it may be called so for them to come out and step out and say that on their public LinkedIn profile to me that was an indication that it was over and I don't know when it was actually posted. I'm, I hope it was posted a few days before, so it makes my point a little bit more, you know, um, uh, you know, clued in, whatever it may be. But if it wasn't posted on the same day, clearly they already got told as management that this deal was already dead in the water. So that's interesting to see in that regard that they absolutely, uh, you know, update people inside the company and let them know. And then once they let them know, they said they come out there and spoke what their piece. But obviously the other side of it is that this lady didn't say nothing beforehand, wasn't brave enough to really say the stuff with her balls. But then the moment I just kind of gave her quote unquote permission, that's when she stepped out and said what she said. But again, another thing we can go on about. This our second paragraph about the fire review is interesting because I remember reading the first statement Adidas put out where they essentially said um, the uh, the partnership between Ye is on pause and we're reviewing it and then Ye did that whole like fuck Adidas thing they stole my design blah 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 blah. At the time I thought the Adidas statement about their pausing the uh, partnership and this under review was a bit of a vague open ended kind of non committal statement where it felt like they were waiting for Ye to basically have a come to Jesus moment and see the light and go on an apology tour and walk everything back so they continue making money with him because why not but actually what you're seeing is that there are people in that board or on the Adidas board who generally did want to end the deal ASAP and maybe the compromise and the sort of split decision was that they'd put it under review and see what he would be saying in the subsequent days and weeks and obviously the man doubled and tripled down and it went the way it went and it also makes me think about that one board member on Adidas who Kanye was speaking about. Do you guys remember? It was some Asian lady. Um, and I think he had a real bee in his bonnet about her. But then unfortunately for, for Kanye, that Asian lady who was on the Adidas board was also, I think, somebody who was linked to JP Morgan Chase. Either she was or her husband was something to do with that. And it's no surprise that JP Morgan Chase kicked him out and Adidas kicked him out also, which goes to show how important it is when you're working with corporations to actually maintain 
your relationships, to cultivate relationships, to make people like you and stuff is really important. As important as it is to be super talented and be somebody that's going to obviously um, bring value to that agreement or that partnership or make them money, that's also important because if Kanye wasn't Kanye, Adidas wouldn't care about him anyway, I understand. But once you're through that door to keep that deal going, you really have to make sure that you're doing all the right political things, whether that's attending randomly somebody's flipping daughter's soccer game, whether that's going to perform at somebody's flipping bar mitzvah, whether that's just just being cool at the company meetings and kind of hanging around and maybe talking a bit more with people after the fact. All those little things actually go a long way to kind of keep that relationship ticking over and keeping it sweet so that if you do come into a situation where you're blasting off and saying some crazy shit, you've got some people who are going to ride for you in a boardroom when it comes to the vote thing but it looks like he had no allies whatsoever in that room or no one willing to put their neck out for him the other thing i thought was interesting about that point was that they said immediately they were going to end the partnership it wasn't something that they were even thinking about kind of changing something that could maybe maybe they're thinking of a way of like i don't know um developing and releasing whatever was in the calendar right now they're legitimately pulling stuff off the shelves pulling stuff out of the shops telling accounts to stop selling yeezy it's crazy and i think the guy um from complex brendan dunn dune the guy with the really corny moustache he actually said recently that he's got word from retailers and other stores who are basically being told by Adidas to pull all Yeezy products from their from their flipping shelves obviously he's a registered registered sellers not fucking resellers but still it goes to show that they're not even trying to squeeze any like last juices out of the Yeezy partnership they're legitimately severing ties with him in a way that you get severed ties with a company if you get fired under gross misconduct terms right they lock off your email they delete any flipping sign of you on the site you didn't exist prior and you're just dead to them completely this is the same way they're treating yay which is pretty incredible to see somebody of that level be treated in this way but it also goes to show that there are certain things you just can't say and if you do say the things that he says you're going to get treated horribly the other thing i want to say just as a kind of a style and brand guide thing which is interesting adidas when they write the name adidas even if it's coming after a punctuation it's always a lowercase a i just assumed it would always be an uppercase a after a punctuation or if it's the first low you know word on in in a sentence but it's not it's always lowercase don't you find that interesting obviously if it's all caps it's all caps but it's always lowercase always hmm interesting anyway we continue the other thing that i thought was interesting also was this paragraph here where it said the short-term impact of up to 250 million euros and i think people are hypothesizing that it's somewhere between 246 dollars million dollars whatever it may be so them essentially putting this in is obviously something to appease some of the stockholders and shareholders whatnot to basically let them know hey it's a big loss but don't worry um we're going to be able to bounce back off of it but if you add that with what Ye Ye said about Yeezy accounting for 48 percent of the overall s online sales of adidas that's a huge huge hit they're taking so essentially the um, adidas's morality and principles are costing them 250 million this year alone that's what you have to keep in mind it's not for the entirety of the deal only this year alone is costing them 250 million and you would imagine that 250 million is definitely tied to bonuses and targets for some people in the boardroom so everybody is kind of suffering from this it's not only the stores it's not only them as a brand and their you know long lasting beef and competition with nike it's also their pockets like people who are maybe counting on that money to take their family to aspen to take their family to fucking you know carbo to go to greece for christmas whatever they were going to do with that to buy their wives you know a couple of pair of new tits or a new horse those things are going to, have to be put on hold because Ye wanted to go out there and blame the jews for everything absolutely wild um so again should you give them credit for that sort of thing i'm not too sure and then the last sentence was another interesting one after everything they said here in the first sentence about owning about taking everything off the shelves this last, this last paragraph is really curious. ADS is the sole owner of all design rights of existing products as well as the previous and new colorways under the partnership. More information will be given as the company's um, Q3 earnings call on November the 9th. So essentially, they own all the design rights for every Yeezy item that we have out so far, which is hilarious because this Kanye guy rants and raves about all the bad contracts he's in and the fact that the Jews have conspired to write him to put bad contracts and they're controlling everything with malarkey. But then it's also the same guy who turns around and says he doesn't read and takes pride in the fact that he doesn't read anything and takes pride that everything that he does is done with a feeling, is done with a gut, is done with emotion. 
but so far he's been him Joe Budden and Wale are basically um, world champions of signing bad deals and then crying about them after the fact, but then also wanting everyone to know that they're flipping geniuses in business, especially Joe Budden and Kanye. They, they don't stop talking about how genius level they are in terms of culture, in terms of business, in terms of you know, the corporations. But then when it comes down to it, and you actually see the details of their contracts and stuff and their deals, they basically get signed into terrible deals that don't favor them in the slightest. And the thing that's really funny about this is that Kanye is quite controversial, right? There's nothing new, but he's always been like this. So I don't understand why somebody as controversial as Kanye would ever sign a deal that wouldn't give him an out if he did say something crazy or that wouldn't protect him if he did something crazy. Because essentially it seems like ALS have worked a deal in place where if he did anything that was dumb, because I think that the time they review is basically time for the people in HR and legal to comb through the contract and see where they can kind of wiggle out of. So I'm sure them terminating the deal the way they terminated it is essentially them terminating it for gross misconduct, which essentially might mean that they're going to try to get away or try to avoid having to pay him out of anything. So whatever he has now is what he has now. Hence why they made that point about we're stopping any payments. So any royalties, any subsidiaries, any whatever else he was earning on it, completely gone. And he used to brag about that often, right? He used to brag that, oh, I make more money on my shoes than Jordan does. The easy jumps over the jump man. You can't talk to me. I guess that's one of the kind of um, sweet, maybe karmic things that people have out there if you're not a fan of Kanye. He was out here saying to people that you can't talk to him if you're not a millionaire and now, or if you're not a billionaire, sorry. And now he's clearly not going to be a billionaire because a lot of his wealth was tied up in the easy and, um, you know, the projections of it for the future were just crazy, especially if it kept on increasing the way it did and he kept churning out amazing, amazing product after amazing product. Um, it would have obviously gone to the moon in general, I think. But the fact that he did what he did is kind of, you know, maybe scuppered it a little bit and maybe soiled or maybe ruined the reputation of the brand a bit. I'm not too sure if that's actually true. I think if he did decide to go on a bit of an apology tour and manufacture everything in-house, people would still queue up and buy whatever new thing he puts out there. He just has that mindless touch about him. But... I find that end bit really curious because obviously, number one, it pr it kind of highlights that Kanye signed a bad deal. Number two, it kind of also puts out there that Adidas are saying that we can do whatever we want with these designs. We're taking off whatever's on the on the lineup now, but maybe when things cool down, we're going to put out another 750. We're going to put out a 350. We're going to put out some 700s. We don't care what you think. And if you're curious to know what actual designs Adidas actually owns under this agreement, somebody on the West Sub Ever, which is the best Sub Ever when it comes to Kanye West news, put out these um pat these pattern applications, I'm assuming, right? Um, courtesy uh of adidas that they were able to get because i guess they're part of the public what's that thing called whatever that word is called but these are basically it right so you've got 750s that essentially adidas own <laughs> the flipping design rights to uh, you've got 350s also and the elements on it in terms of the stripe the sole and stuff um some of the essence on the top the knit obviously on the top as well and then i think you've got here a dove with the same thing with the seam then you've got the foam runners. Um, they're also something that have been, you know, owned as design rights by Adidas, which is absolutely crazy. You've got the sole on one of these. I forgot what they're called. What are these ones called? These are called the Ventos, right? The one with the kind of weird upper shape on them as well. They're obviously owned by Adidas Design Rights too. You've got these bad boys, which haven't even come out yet, which are deemed to be what? Um, we don't actually know the official name of these yet at the moment, but they're basically the shoe that Kanye wore when he was wearing all red at that kind of concert, maybe for Donda, the first album actually, that made that what they kind of look like to me. And then we've also got an application again for the foam runner um, on the top as well. Maybe this is a, to do with the actual uh, top or the actual form factor of the entire thing. I'm not really too sure, but there's quite a lot here that they own the rights to. And another shoe also that they own the rights to is the, what's that? Is this a 700? What is this one? I'm not too sure actually the numbers of them. This is a 700, right? 700 Venter or something. Or maybe I'm I'm mistaken. I'm not really too sure. But either way, there's a lot of shoes here that they own the right to. 15 years, fucking hell. So clearly they're flexing their, their muscle and obviously reminding him who kind of is boss. And then to also continue this, we have a statement courtesy of Gap. 
Gap have also decided to flip and pull the plug on Kanye and get rid of all the Yeezy Gap stuff to the point where the Yeezy Gap site itself is basically down and points back to basically Gap um, and you have to select your region of where you're at but essentially the Yeezy Gap experiment is also over people have shared pictures of certain stores essentially selling whatever they have left on the shop floor and then nothing else is going to come in I've also heard that people are emailing customer services at Gap and basically asking them because recently the perfect hood re-released at $60 actually and people were buying tons of it and it was all getting shipped so clearly they're shipping out whatever you order now but anything else is not going to be made available so don't be surprised if you do see some Yeezy Gap products in in flipping TJ Maxx or TK Maxx and stuff I can definitely see that happening and I wonder if it may affect the resale price people might end up paying more for it I think that what happened definitely for Yeezy in general but this is a statement courtesy of Gap Inc and their press room it says in uh, in September, Gap announced ending its Easy Gap partnership. Our former partners recently didn't even say his name. Our former partners' remarks and behaviour further underscore why we are taking immediate steps to remove Gap product from our stores, and we have shut down EasyGap.com. Don't you find it a little bit funny? that these kind of, I won't say cancellations, but these sort of efforts by these platforms and corporations always seem um, always seem to be um, coordinated. Adidas basically said the same thing in terms of taking everything off and basically Yeezy Gap or Gap is basically saying the same thing too. They're taking everything off the shelves. They're not even trying to make it work. They're not even trying to sell what they have or rinse the entire catalog or release all the other SKUs that they're working on. No, no, no. Whoever's out there is out there. If you get it, you get it. But apart from that, we're wiping our hands clean of this guy. Um, and it continues to say anti-Semitism and racism and hate in any form are inexcusable and not tolerated in accordance of our values or our beliefs of our customers, employees and shareholders. We are partnering organizations that combat hate and discrimination. So clearly they're going to do a symbolic sort of gesture and give away certain money, amount of money to groups that basically um, fight against anti-Semitism, you'd imagine. The curious thing about this is that you would think that Gap were the ones that needed Yeezy more in terms of, you know, pulling themselves back into some sort of relevancy, um, pulling them back into the cultural conversation of product and clothing and shit, making them maybe a staple of people that want to go and buy, you know, basics in the in the shape of what Kanye was doing with Yeezy Gap and working with Demna in terms of the kind of sizeless, basic kind of drapery, big shit, whatever. It wasn't sizeless because you could buy size, but you know what I mean. That kind of big silhouette, um, easy to wear stuff with that kind of color palette. It felt like that was maybe something Gap actually needed but they actually didn't need it. It feels like, it feels like they were so set in their ways, which maybe caused the issues with Kanye in the first place because he was trying to pull them kicking and screaming into modernity, into the 21st century, but they were more than happy to kind of keep doing what they've been doing for, for, for whatever. And I guess so far it's been working. So they're not going to change it in any way, shape or form. And like I said before, Kanye didn't obviously ingratiate himself with the boardroom, with the people working there as executive level. And they just said, look, it's not worth the hassle. This guy's talented, but he's not the be all and end all. We were here before him. We're going to be here after him. And they basically did him and i guess this maybe is a lesson in that right you can never think you're that important really because when it comes down to it these companies will let especially when it comes down to them actually suffering any reputational damage off the back of it for free they're definitely going to be willing to cut you asap so that's definitely for sure and then to make matters even worse this article courtesy of the miss internet basically has a long running list of every single brand that's dropped count kanye off the back of these anti-semitism anti remarks that he's had over the last week or so and it's pretty extensive let's just say that i'm going to read over the list of people here um let me just go past them if i didn't miss anything um yeah so the first one i think they're doing it in chronological order because of the people that did it gap on October 25th, the Gap retailer says it's taking media steps to remove everything, right? CAA, the creative arts agency, dropped West as a client after of his anti-Semitic comments. Usually CAA drop people when they're, you know, um, accused of diddling. They're accused of doing something heinous to women. But you don't usually hear them dropping people for, you know, the wrong political, social kind of point of views, you would imagine. 
Um, it would be funny if those two people behind Kanye were Jewish too and it would just basically give him them daggers as he's watching his daughter play basketball. That'd be hilarious. Um, it continues here. Another one, Balenciaga. Balenciaga is no longer in a relationship and he planned to future projects, which I think is the one that probably hurt him the most, especially if he spent as much as he said he spent at Balenciaga near, what's that, five to 10 million this year alone. The fact that he was working with Demna from the beginning and believed in him as a designer and as an artist or creator in general and somebody that worked with him at Yeezy somebody else working with him on Donda all that good stuff and then now his boss has basically told him hey you're not allowed to play with him anymore he's a bad boy uh, Vogue have come out and cancelled him and basically it's distanced himself from him which is funny because they didn't do this when Kanye was out here flipping taking a piss out of that Gabby lady right that um, journalist or editor I think she's a fashion director if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken please forgive me if I got her title wrong but when Kanye was out here essentially insulting in public a black queen basically taking the piss out of her in a way fat shaming her without fat shaming her because he was saying those kind of things about her because she wasn't a tall skinny white lady or some hot girl with a big bum and huge tits you know what i mean he was he felt comfortable to say those kind of things to her because you know that's the kind of people that he generally probably doesn't get along with right people that kind of look or you know speak the way that gabby does and he went after and attacked her in a way that was really disgusting really heinous what did they do nothing Tremaine came out and basically took the bullets for everybody to the point where he was turned into a meme and Kanye made t-shirts of him and made a whole brand around him and he had to suffer off the back of that whereas Vogue basically got to get away with it scot-free but now that he's done something irrehensible and everybody else is cancelling him let's join in but they can get fucked um, the MRC documentary interesting one this says though the film's company direct documentary on West is already finished it will not be distributed which is crazy I guess someone will end up leaking it but it says here, this morning after discussion with our filmmakers, distributor person, we made a decision not to be proceed with any distribution of our recently complete documentary about Kanye West. We cannot support any content that amplifies the platform. Executive Modi Wisak and Asif Shatu and Scott Tenley wrote in the October 24th memo, per variety, Kanye's producer and sampler of music. Last week, he sampled the music and a tune and charted over 30,000 years, the lie that Jews are evil and conspire to control the world of their own gain. Ooh, that's bars, 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 bars. I that's them now finally has obviously come out and said what they've said. Um, what is this? I would actually like to get the, what she says about, I would actually love to hear what Julia Fox has to say um, about the whole Kanye thing, actually. That might be an interesting perspective, especially because she was the first kind of, uh, kind of, what do you call it? Famousy type person he was with post Kim, right? I think in terms of public relationships. So I'd be quite curious to hear what she has to say about the whole thing, about dating him and what that was all like and about what's happening in terms of his cancellation going forward. But for me, when it comes, to, yeah, but I guess for me, when it comes to this kind of stuff, when it comes to Kanye being cancelled for what he said, and he, you know, obviously what he said was abhorrent, you shouldn't be saying those kind of things about any community. I'm okay with that sort of action if when it's warranted but the only thing that i don't i'm not okay with is the unfairness of it all and i think it's something that i've kind of maybe internalized because of my own struggles you know growing up in a very conservative family where essentially everything that was happening in that household was unfair you know certain things could be said to you but you couldn't say certain things back you weren't allowed to answer back you weren't allowed to have an opinion or it was basically not encouraged or you know it was ridiculed and you got to feel a little bit stupid a little bit you know idiotic whatever it may be so maybe that kind of lack of fairness has maybe carried on with me um in my adult years as well where i'm kind of on my own but in general the one thing I hate is unfairness and I also hate inconsistency. It just annoys me so much. Like if you're going to punish me for something, also make sure you punish somebody else regardless of their reputation, regardless of their class, regardless of their bank balance, regardless of their family or who they're linked to. Everyone should be treated the same. But of course, we don't live in a fair world and I'm somebody who ascribes to the idea of living or navigating in the world as is, as opposed to trying to mold the world to your own wants, needs and desires that's how it shouldn't be but when it comes to the fashion industry it's hard to bloody swallow Kanye West gets absolutely annihilated right by every single industry like people are coming out in terms of celebrities and throwing up these really horrendous cringy very vague comments about supporting the Jewish community that don't even mention Ye's name that just say some blanket statement that's essentially at the Jewish version of the flipping black square when the whole BLM process was going on just to basically appease their corporate sponsors and to do this performative thing that they actually care when they don't 
all this nonsense things is happening right and then in the fashion industry Kanye gets cancelled essentially from it which they probably were looking forward to because they never liked him from the beginning from the time he debuted in Paris Fashion Week was that what 2012 2011 I forgot what that year was they've always wanted to kind of get rid of him anyway in general and essentially for me I feel like getting rid of him was essentially a dog whistle to get rid of all black and brown people because when Kanye Virgil and all those and the gang and Don C and everybody came through wearing that outfit that they were they were wearing basically going to show and maybe buying flipping tickets to go carrying favors and not being invited and just kind of making a loud presence there and changing the overall kind of look and feel of fashion shows to the point now you go to fashion shows and you see more people like me standing outside stunting having a good time taking pictures and shit they don't like that the establishment they obviously want it to be more whitewashed they want it to be fucking loads of clothes and sort of emanuela alt and shit and obviously the fashion industry has changed for the better but you cancel you cancel Kanye that's fair but then on the back of but then when I think back of it something that happened a few weeks ago maybe a couple of months ago this news courtesy of Vogue Daniel Lee succeeds Ricardo Tishi at Burberry so if you're going to cancel one person for saying crazy stuff right about a community of people um and obviously because maybe Kanye stuff was recorded plenty of times on different platforms and he double tripled down but still why is it that Kanye can get cancelled but Daniel Lee cannot and I'm not for cancel culture in general I've said it from the very beginning i hate cancel culture i think if your fans are willing to back you and they're willing to keep supporting you for the thing that you do you should be able to continue doing it i don't think these platforms should be coming in and telling you you can't because essentially some of these platforms especially the social media ones are essentially a public service that's essentially what they are they're essentially they're, they're essentially like i won't say human right but they, they, it's coming close to that right having a twitter having a social media presence if you want it should be something that you every person should be basically entitled to having until it comes to a point where you don't want to have it anymore so to, to basically take people's voice away um from doing that because you don't like what they say is horrible especially when it's selective and in this case i feel like it is because it says here, Daniel Lee succeeds to at Burberry. Um, it says here, Daniel Lee has been appointed chief creative officer at Burberry. The former Bottega Veneta designer who exited Italian house in November will succeed the current lead, um, Ducati Tishi on October, sorry, the 3rd of October. So he's already started work there and oversee all collections. London Fashion Week Autumn 2023 in February will see Lee's Burberry debut. It says a quote, this is from Burberry. Daniel is an exceptional talent with a unique understanding of today's luxury consumer and a strong record of commercial success. And his appointment reinforces the ambitions we have for Burberry, commented new CEO Jonathan Aykroyd is for his first appointment in the house. I'm excited about working closely with him and I'm confident he will have the impact we are aiming for in this next phase, supported by our talented and experienced teams. Hmm. The fact he said closely working with him supported made me think that they have they're gonna keep a close eye on him. But anyway, it continues. The news comes after an emotional swan song for Tishy, who took the last bow at Burberry, surrounded by big time names such as Naomi Campbell, da, da, da. Bradford, Bourne Lee, who has a very different shoes to fill, but demonstrated his knack for a brand new invention when he jump started Bottega from the Sleepy Heritage label into a cult favourite. He's been edited to stealth favourite since the days under Phoebe Father Celine, with more than a few waiting for his homegrown spin on Burberry. Watch this space so this entire article they featured they didn't mention one thing about why he's been out um, you know on the sidelines and not designing this whole time and why he left the Bottega Veneta right no mention of it whatsoever so Vogue are obviously in cahoots with Burberry in terms of keeping that news stum but here's the reason and I covered it already in my podcast previously another episode so Daniel Lino Bottega Veneta breakup this is courtesy of a website called the Lexington Lions so big up them for putting this together two weeks ago the fashion industry abruptly received the news that the now ex-creative director of Bottega Veneta Daniel Lee would be parting ways with, with the Caring Own Fashion House in a statement released by both Lee and Caring Socials the split was summed up as a joint decision so clearly trying to protect this asset trying to protect this talent that they know that they can squeeze some money out of which was a fairly vague statement leaving fashion critics and commentators to speculate what could have caused a breakup the more people talked about it the more obvious it seemed that things were adding up especially when you consider if i'm not mistaken daniel lee's last collection at Bottega veneta either the last one or the last two i think the last two back to back one is at berghain where I think it was a famous um, show during COVID lockdown that Burner Boy went to, that Skepta went to, that Virgil DJ that I think it was in Berkheim, or I think they might have DJ at Ace Hotel Berlin, I'm not too sure, but basically the show was in um, Berkheim. They had an after dinner there too, and a party and all that malarkey. And then the other show was in Detroit. 
and that was also during covid lockdown and all that stuff as well so they spent a lot of money doing these shows in these far flung paces so to go from that to him suddenly leaving as a joint decision bs to me Daniel Lee was appointed creative director of the house in 2019, meaning that his entire stay only spanned three years and less than a dozen fashion seasons. In that short time period, Lee had made waves and breathing life into the Italian house and given it the modern Instagram worthy look. The same year he began working at Bottega, he took home four CFDA awards um, and more than any other designer had taken home in one night in the history of the event, including names like Alexander McQueen. Lee had created a series of instant bestsellers and became synonymous with his new Bottega, such as the pouch bag and a square toe woven pumps. He even set house codes like making Bottega Green a staple colour. In recent report directly from carrying Bottega's parent company, 9.3% of 2021, 2020's revenue was attributed to the brand. No small feat when you consider that on Kevin's roster you could also find places, houses like Gucci, you Saint Laurent, Blanchard. But nowadays, you know, Blanchard is way, way ahead, so it's not even close. <clears throat> Almost instantly, the fashion industry could smell something was fishy in the air. The joint decision was announced on November 10th, coincidentally the same day as CFDA awards, and even more suspiciously on a night where Daniel was nominated for two awards. Um, and it's just, uh, why would a designer of that magnitude announce such an important night, both creative director and brand? Needless to say, Lee did not take any awards home that night. Critics had, uh, had also begun to point out the verbiage used in the announcement. For starters, Kerrin described Lee's work as a collaboration, possibly an attempt to distance himself from Daniel, and emphasized that the decision was mutual between both parties. Some Twitter users also point out the short time between the two recent collections, Salon 2 and Salon 3, was with only six weeks in between. It's a very small amount of time to put in between two major collections and many felt that it was rushed WWE which might explain why they were so trash by the way WWE reported on reliable sources that a close brand um, who were working or speaking about Lee's less than professional work environment According to WWD, anonymous interviewees Lee's tenure at the house was littered with numerous veteran employees quitting due to being unhappy with the atmosphere of the company. So essentially, he was a tyrant and a bit of a cunt. Another source also said to WWD, at the moment when the company was healthy and the brand is performing so well, there must have been personal reasons behind this decision. The source also stated Lee was fired with immediate effect, contrary to what the original had been stated. Amidst a discussion on why Lee was leaving Bottega, the company appointed design Bottega, design director Matt Matteo Blasi as, as its newest creative director and this has been a silver lining in the entire fiasco given that Blasi is an industry veteran working under the name such as Raph Simmons and Joe Galliano and the funny thing about it because that's the thing about the fashion industry they really hyped up Daniel Lee they blew smoke up his ass they gave us the impression that he was this next iteration of fucking Lee McQueen but then when it came down to it, when Matteo Blasi's name was being flipping floated as a new creative director of Bottega Veneta, everybody that you would want to listen to and respect their opinion on fashion was saying, nah, Matteo Blasi is the guy. He's the actual talent. He's the one behind the scenes doing this, doing that, doing that. So all that smoke and mirrors that were given to about Daniel Lee was basically smoke and mirrors when effectively the actual real dude was Matteo Blasi to the point where this Bottega now under his stewardship has just carried on going the way this you know Bottega was when it first started with Daniel Lee nothing has really changed in terms of the quality and the level of club product that he's putting out there so clearly it shows they haven't missed a beat because the person who's designing now clearly was maybe the one that was important in the first place so that's another segment it continues evidence started to pile up pointed to the idea that the decision was made wholly by caring and wasn't a joint decision at all it was also increasingly obvious that Daniel Lee did not have a, a best reputation amongst his peers then on the evening of November the 17th, new information came to light. At roughly around 6.30pm, Luis Pizano, who hasn't returned to Twitter since, to be honest, he had this and he just basically, no, was it this or, no, it was the Rihanna stuff, innit? it? Yeah, he'd spread the Rihanna news that allegedly A$AP Rocky was cheating on Rihanna and he hasn't returned back to Twitter since. I think he's just on Instagram solely now. But it says here, Luis Pizano, fashion commentator and high fashion Twitter councilman, took to the platform to disclose information of an alleged close person to the matter. He said, Allegedly, then this comes from an incredibly close to the matter and reliable source. Daniel Lee was promptly fired by Francois Henri Pinot after he allegedly called somebody a fucking nigger in a meeting at Bottega Veneta. So this guy is going around calling people fucking niggers at Bottega Veneta, even though he created an entire brand and he basically used the marketing to kind of curry favor with the black community, had loads of black ambassadors buying the stuff, made it very covetable in terms of that community that you know people were going out there buying the stuff and showing off the massive green bag of the things that they were buying and stuff they got seeded. But then he also had the flipping guts and the wherewithal to call somebody a fucking nigger in a meeting. 
to the point where now Kering made excuses for him. I think they I think when he put it out, Kering immediately replied to Lewis and said, No, this is not what happened. They made excuses for him, they lied about the reason or they didn't explain why he got fired or why they parted companies with him. And the entire industry went quiet about what he said and what he done. And now off the back of that, he's now got rewarded with a creative director job at Burberry. That's the thing that I think is unfair. So if you're gonna punish and you're gonna, you know, ice out Kanye for saying his anti-Semitic comments why isn't somebody calling someone a fucking nigger in a meeting hold the same weight as somebody being anti-Semitic please somebody explain that and they're both equally as bad I'm not saying calling you know essentially blaming Jews for all the ills of the world and essentially ascribing them um, for everything bad that's gone in your life and making them out to be this you know evil monolith of people who are out there to flip in control the world and all this crazy conspiracy theories is not a bad thing to say of course it's a bad thing to say we all know this we all got brains we're all common sense people we're all rational people we're all grown-ups but you cannot punish one person for saying those kind of things even if they're doubling down even if they're standing next to candace owens or candace fucking owens that absolute you know heathen who's ruined flipping kanye west life with one documentary bloody hell um you can't punish one person one way and then absolutely reward somebody even though they said something so heinous as calling somebody a fucking nigger. In what circumstances, in what scenario is using that kind of language acceptable? I'll give you a hint. None. Especially if he's calling a black person a fucking nigger. This guy, this flipping, this dude calling somebody a nigger is absolutely unacceptable. I hope it was one of his friends. I hope it was like a fucking, what's his name? That country music star that was coming out of his car, going home and someone recorded him because he was being belligerent. And he, you know, they find out through the recording that in their little friendship group, they like to call each other niggas, even though they're all white, right? And it was really strange. But maybe this is something that he says as a banter to his other white friends. It would still be unacceptable. But most likely it was to a black person that he was frustrated with in a meeting that he said the thing that he said, or maybe he said it in a PewDiePie way, where whenever he's angry and frustrated at something, he says, nigger, nigger. If he can't pattern cut something properly, nigger. When he can't get the buttons to fit the way he wants to fit, nigger. When the zip is, is annoying, nigger. When you can't figure out what colors to use nigger like that's crazy here what he ended up doing so if this guy can get away with it and get re rewarded doing you know work for fucking burberry why can't kanye be forgiven and continue having his work plastered all over vogue why does he have to have his relationship with blend sugar fucking ended and halted if people like this can survive and have a career it's completely unfair and again it's not to say i want him cancelled i just want fair i just want parity i want i want an even playing field i want one person to be treated the same way another person gets treated in my opinion especially as well when you consider his last couple of collections for Batek Veneta were fucking pants anyway so it's not like he has a huge catalogue of stuff that you could maybe say hey let's make excuses for him in the same way you made excuses for John Galliano for saying what he said and again let's not replay that because what he said was absolutely nuts right but come on man let's have some level of fucking fairness in the scene industry but we don't because these people are all full of shit that's the good thing about being a fashion fan like I am and just kind of being a consumer you can dip in and dip out buy your thing and keep it on arm's length but when you get too close to it it can really hurt your feelings it can really hurt your feelings anyway that's it from me now thank you for tuning into the show i really do appreciate it as always if it's your first time check out the show via the podcast app you know what to do smash like no share actually and leave me a five-star review if you're listening via every other platform just make sure you share and all that good stuff if you're watching through youtube smash the like hit subscribe you know what to do leave me a comment let me know what you think of the show that'd be greatly appreciated and of course if you listen to the audio app you'll hear my tune of the day and if you're watching via youtube you won't hear no tune or just fade to black get back to doing what you should be doing don't listen to me i'm a dunce peace